they were. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, we want them working in some way they could work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, so one, one thing that, does anyone else have a point? Because I, I want to say the one thing I have learned again from the same person, what I have learned a couple of really great things from educators. One thing that I do in the classroom is um, if a student proposes an answer, rather than repeating that myself to them using their words, I'll ask one of the other students in the class to use their own words to describe what it is. And, you know, I make a joke going, I don't speak eighth grader. Can you guys help me answer that? And let me hear it in your words. Sometimes they even do a third person. And often they'll catch each other or they'll be correcting each other and that discourse starts. And once they see it modeled in the whole class discussion, then they learn how to do it in small groups as well. So that's, that's one trick that I have enjoyed. It also helps kids realize it's their responsibility to listen to others. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say it makes me think about like working with really young children and asking them, like, how did you know that? How did you think about that? I've had a lot of kids either say, I just know it or my brain told me. Yes. And so I think a lot of times it starts there. Um, and what do then, you then what do you say when they say that? I don't actually, I don't remember what I say in the moment. I think I just try to dig deeper in, into it, um, but that response sticks with me because I don't know how many kids, I mean, and not just in math and reading too, like how do you know that if it's not just a right there question and they're like, my brain. <laughs> and, That's um, right. and, they, and so there's like this, there, a lot of the thought processes that we're talking about require metacognition. Um, and so, and like, also, what I know about metacognition is that modeling is a really powerful tool to put thinking strategies on display. And so helping kids visualize and see that this is what's happening. And I think about even like having, you know, when I was teaching, anytime I wanted to have them think through something or learn a new strategy for, it could have been behavior based, like anything not necessarily academic content we would have either a pair of students or a small group of students model like good examples and not good examples and we would compare them um, and like talk about what is it that we're looking for here and and um, there's lots of ways that we could go into that and kids love like if you ask two kids to say show me how we don't want to see discourse happen in the classroom. Oh, they have so much fun with that. And then we can like really build a lot of rich, explicit, like this is what that means when it's brand new for kids and like keep coming back to that for different kinds of routines and like keep drawing to those examples. Remember when we talked about this? Remember when so-and-so did this? And uh, like just setting structures in place to, to build new skills and routines. Yeah. yeah, I I saw Deborah Ball um, from the University of Michigan actually teach um, before she became the guru at the University of Michigan. She actually started in a third grade classroom, which always fascinated me. Mm. Um, but I she's got a lot of video of her teaching in a third grade classroom, and when a kid would explain his work, she would um, and they might record what they were doing, um, and she would name that way of doing it Chad's method or you know, Callie's method. And the kids took such ownership of that and they actually would refer to it as, oh, I did it using Callie's method. So it, it really invites, number one, it really makes kids thinking important in the classroom. Um, and and um, it, it was just really, really powerful. It helps the kids to take ownership of their ideas, but also um, use the ideas of others, mm -hmm. especially if, somebody says something that makes more sense to me than the way I thought about it. And I've actually had teachers do that in workshops. They'll come up and solve something in a way that's very different than the way I thought about it. And I go, whoa, I like your way better than my way. I think I'm going to try that next time. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up um, is I think one thing that will help that you might model when you're working with teachers, a, a strategy that you might use with your, when you're working with teachers and then they might use it in the classroom um, is to develop some norms. So how are we active listeners? How do we um, help somebody to make their thinking clear, clearly, uh, clearer to us 
without being rude or sounding, you know, um, making them feel that they're wrong or there's something wrong with their thinking. So this idea of just developing some simple norms about how does this work in the classroom, I think might be really helpful as a starting point. Yeah. I always think about that as um, how do you strike a tone of curiosity, mm. right? It's like the, if you can strike a tone of authentic curiosity, like really genuinely explain it to me, I really want to know and communicating that in nonverbal ways and with your tone can completely like recalibrate a moment and move it away from being about the judgment, I think, and more to like, oh, you're genuinely curious, like you care about understanding my thinking. Um, and it, I don't know, works, yeah. I think. I think that's really valuable. And it's, it's, I think strong mathematicians have that answer that Callie hears a lot, right? It's just there, I see it that way. And so, um, and Naomi, I wanna ask you, I wanna put you on your spot, cause I know that you used to say your son used to do that when you guys would, you'd bring activities home that we do here and he'd go, I just know it is. And I encourage you to ask a few things. Tell me what if that's been successful. I'm, I'm making myself nervous too because she may have said it was a bust. Um, no, and actually the most recent example um, I know I told Pow is we were working on the Fibonacci sequence and I was writing down the first few numbers for him and I gave it to him and I said, okay, here, can you figure out a pattern and what comes next? And then he said, I forget the order. I forget what I did. But he said, well, I was going to say eight, but that's not, that's not right. And I said, why? And he said, oh, but I was going to say you had to add the previous two in order to get the next one, but you didn't write a five down. So that can't be the right one. And I said, oh no, I forgot. Like it was my mistake. I just wrote it wrong because that was me. And then he went back and he explained, oh no, well that can't be it. Otherwise there would be a five there and then you could do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're pushing them to, to justify their thinking, right? And that's the other role, right? The listener's job is to be able to say, I see your thinking, right? Or say, because I've had kids go, it's just is. I mean, I could tell, and frankly, I said it myself when I was a kid, but the, the Joel, uh, like great mathematicians find patterns and then they figure out what those patterns mean. And that's so much what mathematics is. And so if you leave going, huh, that was interesting, but don't understand why, well, you're not being the mathematician that we need you to be. Um, and that happens at all levels. So that's one thing. The other I love what you just Go ahead, Linda. I love what you said because um, I always worry about, um, and maybe I over worry, that if a kid's going to see something that's done incorrectly, um, even if you show, you know, um, those are the things they tend to remember. Let me just put it like that. Mm -hmm. But I love the way that you just talked about that because um, your son actually challenged his own thinking based on what you did and was almost put in a position where he had to justify his thinking, even though he thought he was wrong because it didn't match your thinking. Um, and it's a nice way to get, um, it's a nice way to make an intentional error to have kids recognize that rather than picking oh, up that Oh, that was error. totally intentional. I was just testing. Oh, you were totally intentional? All right, but you can do no, it that I way was too. Not. I, it was oh, my right. error. I forgot. No, <laughs> boy. <Yeah. laughs> No, he called me. Uh, that is great. I worry about showing kids the way somebody did something wrong, especially young ones. Yeah, right. But on the other hand, if somebody makes a mistake and somebody else says, well, I'm a, my thinking might, might have been wrong because, and I think that all gets unveiled. I think that's one of the powers of discourse is that conversation really actually helps the kids to um, organize the thinking in their head. So that if they have some misconceptions, they can start to think about why that doesn't work that way rather than, um, oh, well, so-and-so did this and um, I must be thinking wrong. So the conversation actually gets them to come to some kind of consensus about what's going on here. Um, there needs I, to be I just think that's so powerful. Yeah. I'm hearing um, the importance of the safe space, 
right? And that the role of the teacher isn't to get you to say the right answer, but to make your thinking visible, this thing that we talk about all the time, right? And so if you're in my class, it's, it's just me getting what I know out there and then having you all, my colleagues, my safe friends, critical friends, helping me make sense of that and then vice versa. So. And then the classroom becomes a learning community mm -hmm. and not just everything for themselves. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, we're going to talk about the rubric in just a minute, but I don't want to lose sight since Peg was one of our guest speakers, Peg Smith. Um, on page 30, they talk about the five, uh, Peg actually wrote the book, The Five Practices for Effectively Using Student Responses in whole class discussions. And what I love about those five practices is they really are a guideline for what the teacher is doing throughout the lesson. And I think if, if as teachers we don't understand that, we can't support um, and even navigate or facilitate the class so that the kids are getting the most out of it they can. So I don't know if you have your books in front of you or not, yeah. but uh, Chad, when I started teaching connective math, I had to learn several of these on my own and I, and I still remember the first time I read the five practices, I thought to myself, where was this when I was teaching connected math? Mm -hmm. uh, because connected math was one of the first times where kids really had to talk about their thinking. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering if anybody has any comments on those. And they are sequential. So, um, and I think it's important for teachers to recognize all five of those steps. Um, so how do I anticipate what kids' responses are going to be, both correct and incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you look at those, I don't want to read them all to you, but if you were to look at those, if you have any questions about those, um, well, I think or what they read them. Look like in the classroom. Let's, let's go through them. So there was anticipate, monitoring the student's work um, and engagement, selecting particular students um, to present, sequencing those presentations to build something, and then connecting the, the different things those are the five things so and i think that those are what makes discourse work mm -hmm. um, or you could just have a random conversation that by the end of and i've been in classrooms where that has happened you know everybody's talking and you leave going i have no idea what just happened i don't understand it any better than i did when i walked in right so that makes teaching pretty easy right that's an easy thing to do as a teacher. I can lecture and also do all those things. Do you think? Or what What do you think about that as a teacher? Well, for you have to, let me, you're so good, Chad, at wait time. I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions about any what any of those mean first. Okay, yeah, any questions about those? I do have, so all of them make a lot of sense to me and like in fact Fatima and I talked a lot about it today so like I'll share when that becomes appropriate if that becomes appropriate in the conversation but um in terms of like sequencing I understand what it means but I would also like to have an example of like what um because like I think we pull student work all the time for them to like explain it and that kind of thing but I'm wondering like if one of you guys could talk more about what that means like how do you do that how do you know what thing is going to come first or or like in that sequence so i let me address it and i'm going to address it with a really specific example um so even getting kids to talk about their if you're giving kids a rich task and expecting them to talk about their thinking it might be difficult for them but one of my favorite tasks um with fourth graders when they're first learning multiplying a two digit number times a one digit number and they've you know they kind of know their facts they understand the meaning of multiplication is to give them an example like 27 times four and ask them to think about two ways they might solve that problem and be ready to explain your thinking um and so you're walking around the room so the teacher has to walk around the room and see what kids and groups are doing um, and i love the idea of, at the very minimum of having them work with a partner so there's even some discussion going on as they're thinking about the initial task before they share with the entire class but the teacher's walking around monitoring and seeing what different groups are doing and as she's doing that she's kind of picking because not everybody's going to get to share so she's picking the ones that she would like she's choosing the methods or the strategies that she would like the whole class to see 
And so one student at, um, decides they're going to add 27 four times. And another kid says they're going to add four 27 times. <laughs> uh, both are correct strategies. Another student remembers, he says, I'm going to do 20 times four and then seven times four. So that kid's really getting an under, starting an understanding of the distributive property. Um, she sees some other kid write down that 25 times four is 100 and two times four is eight. And some other kid has figured out or their parents have shown them how to regroup. Um, and there's usually at least one in the class whose parents has said, there's an easier way to do that. Why are you going through all that? So some kid comes in knowing that. So the teacher has to decide which of those strategies she wants shared. Um, and then in my mind, progressing from probably the simplest one, which to me would be adding 27 four times to the most complex one, um, which is, you know, kind of using the algorithm maybe with no understanding, but using the algorithm. So the sequencing means I'm going to pick the three or four that I want kids to talk about their strategies and why they did what they did. And then to, to start to sequence them from probably the simplest approach, maybe not the most efficient, but the simplest to the one that is maybe the most complex. Maybe I don't even want to call on the kid that did the algorithm because we're not talking about the algorithm yet. We're just trying to pick apart what's going on when I multiply 27 times four. So it's choosing the ones that you want shared and then trying to figure out what order do I want them shared in. So if I start with the kid that knows the algorithm and has him go first, the other kids aren't gonna to wanna to share their thinking because they're gonna say, boy, my, my, my way is stupid compared to that. Where when you're building, all of those kids have entry into some one of those strategies. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the, the, the word that came to my mind is, is the folding, because it's all about that. It's how we, we are building step by step or helping them to get into the, the understanding, to the deep understanding, whatever the level they are. Mm -hmm. I love this phrase. Well, I mean, yeah, we, were talk, we talked about the phrase math for all, right? And, um, and, and to me, that has real um, meaning in a classroom, because... I want the sequence to help the kid who has the least understanding get to the endpoint, because the kid who went straight to the algorithm and understands it, they don't probably need me to be there, right? But but that's not the case for the kid who has that understanding. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah, but Chad, I would even say the kid that knows the algorithm, and even if they understand it, the first time a kid said to me, "25 times four," and I said, "Why did you do that?" And they said, "Because I know there's four quarters in a dollar." Mm -hmm. And I, I still need two more groups of four, so I'd have to add on eight more. I thought that was much deeper understanding than the kid that just could mechanically go through the algorithm. I agree. So even, agree. even if the kid that knows the algorithm and understands why it worked can get a different way to think about it, then mm -hmm. they're also benefiting from that, you know, just sh that idea of sharing one another's understandings. Mm -hmm. Right. I had a fourth grade teacher, by the way, who we were doing this in a class, and she said, oh, my kids would never do it that way. And I happened to be, and I said, that's fine if they don't do it that way. Don't force them to do it that way. That's the whole notion of strategies. And I happened to be visiting her building, and I walked into her classroom, and son of a gun, it was just serendipitous that um, they were doing that problem. And some kids said, I multiplied 25 times four, and then I added on two more groups of four. And she looked at me like, did you tell this kid to do this? <laughs> It was just, because she was so convinced her kids would never think about it that way. And sure enough, one of them did. Um, gave me some credibility too, so. <laughs> that's very interesting. You just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. But that's very interesting, but it has happened. I have noticed in Ecuador, we used sucres before, dollars. Uh -huh. So they pay a little bit more attention to the 25 cents coins. Right. So sometimes they do that. Mm -hmm. Here, it's very interesting, only because the relation with the dollar, this new money in Ecuador, and a similar problem equivalent to the 25, in, let's, let's put it at college level. Uh, sometimes the students come up with questions like that, no? An equivalent different level, and then I ask, oh, who told you that? You know what's the answer they usually give me? Maybe you remember, Paula. The, the math told me that. The math told me that. So it's very interesting when they relate with the mathematics. 
sometimes formulas, sometimes uh, equations, sometimes little things tell the students. And I, I, I joke a lot, no, who told you that? Mm -hmm. The mathematics, look at this term, look at this one, look at this one. So I better use this one in a clever way. So that's a nice way to talk with the mathematics. Right, to ask them the question where they, where they get that. I mean, that's where we want, right? Because mathematics comes from a source and it's, it's something that builds. Uh, that's something that we're definitely talking about. And, and so the role of the teacher then has to be different, right? And, and, and when, when I teach, if I'm thinking about all these five things, anticipating, monitoring, sequ selecting, sequencing, and connecting, I have to be really attuned to my, my students. And one of the things that I thought was really powerful that I learned in my PhD program <clears throat> is when students are working in groups, just to walk around and listen. And that freaks kids out the first time. And you walk behind them and you're just listening and they go, what do you want, what do you want? And I go, I'm just listening. But that, that's really key. If I can take, if I'm not responsible for, for, for telling them the knowledge, but I'm responsible for helping them build the knowledge, that changes my role and that gives me the sort of cognitive space to make sense of what they're doing. And I can really listen and think about how, how they build it. And then of course we can ask the questions that come up and Arthur Powell will be talking with us next week about that. So that's an important thing. Um, and Allie and I talk a lot about how I think if, if you have a strong knowledge of mathematics and you learn mathematics the way we're talking about, that improves social justice and equity. On the one hand, you become a critical thinker, you understand how to build concepts, you're building, keeping track of a lot of things. And in here, one of the things I read was it helps you take the perspective of other people. What did that, that did anyone else attend to that? Did that mean anything to you all? It certainly does to me as I have these huge Facebook fights right now. <laughs> I love that question you wrote when you, you asked to connect social and emotional learning to, the, to the, this course, because uh, it's all about communication as, uh, as Linda said. So if we learn to communicate well, even if it's right, reading or it's uh, verbal, then we learn to respect others and to, cri to critical thinking, uh, critical, to criticize the other thoughts, but in a respectful way. And also uh, something that ha does not happen with uh, traditional classes is also to express themselves. Kids don't know how to express themselves. So that's all about social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. so they know how to, to express and they, are, they feel that they are, um, it's okay to express their thoughts then they are building this, uh, they are developing their social and emotional uh, skills. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful. Do, and is there a place for that in Ecuadorian and Guatemalan culture with the students? I mean, I think it, it earlier in the conversation, somebody said something about how there's like discourse that happens outside of the math classroom. But I actually, I can't speak to Ecuador, but I actually um, have discussed Fatima and I have discussed this on various occasions too, um, just how I don't think that's necessarily the case culturally with a lot of, at least a lot of like the teachers and students that we work with, just because um, it is very much like an like authoritative culture of like don't question, like even between parents and kids and things like that, like can definitely be more of a, like you do it because I told you to, or, you know, like don't. And so I think that what Pa was saying about that, like, how do you express yourself or how that is such like a learned thing that you learn in and out of the classroom. I, I don't, I guess I wouldn't assume that that happens for most of the kids or teachers that we work with here. And I think that's also why it can be such like a, a challenge because it's totally new and you're doing something that you're not, so you're don't question it, don't question anything, any authority, any, and if a teacher's seen as an authority figure, then it's kind of like wrapped up in that. Um, so, I guess, yeah, I guess I just, I think it's like an entirely new skill set that a mm -hmm. lot of people are learning as adults too, right? Which is really hard um, if you've spent most of your life not doing those things and following a certain set of rules. And now it's like, oh, you can actually do this other thing. It's really hard. Um, so I think that socio-emotional socio part is huge. And it's definitely something that we can't assume is happening in other spaces, right? So is it too jingoistic is it too like oh i'm um, go you asked for me to assume that that's an important characteristic 
in other parts of the world because I think that that gives that helps local people feel empowered so that when outsiders come in and say oh we have to solve these problems this way you could say look i've been here and i here think of it this way but but maybe i'm wrong because that's me taking the american united states in perspective what do you all think I think it's super complex because I definitely don't have the answer, but I think I ask myself the same question. Like, what is it that makes it like this thing that we're promoting, what makes it better? Because it is mostly like Western um, centered ideas and like ways of communication that I think are valued above other ways of communication, just like in, just like throughout history and the way that things are. So maybe there's something there. Um, but it's super complex. I don't know. I would love to hear any thoughts anyone else has about it because I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I have the same question, Chad, for sure. Actually, college students, it takes some time for them to, uh, what was the right word to say? To free themselves of these overpowering system they've been studying through, you know? Mm -hmm. And it takes some time. Um, and actually, I have seen a, I'm sorry, I don't have much experience dealing with the school kids, but the college level and working with teachers, I, I have some experience. But sometimes even teachers, don't, they don't want to leave these, how do you say, restrained framework of way of thinking, no? Mm -hmm. And one of the, I know some of you being Galapagos, I really had a hard time there. Mm -hmm. you no, know? and um, because the I can give you a mathematical example. No, it was very weird in the following sense because the minister said, "You know, guys, you have to teach the school the the school, the, the school kids that between two rational numbers there is another one. Which one is this one? Okay, number one plus number two divided by two. They say, well." That's right, that's one. But let's build another example. And I gave a very weird example. I can show it to you. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that they look at the example and say, you are wrong. I say, well, I could be wrong, but hopefully I am not. And, and actually the example, I, I think I have told you, it's kind of, of weird. Hmm. Yeah. Something like this, no? You have this number less than this one. How do you build another one in the middle? So I gave this answer. Say, so, okay, this could be a good one. And the immediate response was, oh, David, you are wrong. Huh. You don't add rational numbers that way. They say, I am not adding. <laughs> I am constructing a rational number between these two. How do you know it's between these two? Well, and then there was a big discussion with teachers. So they had the, they felt comfortable saying you were wrong. That's something. And I, I'm actually wondering if this idea that it's sort of the top down patriarchal is actually colonial. And it comes from ancient Europe because um, I feel like in native communities, indigenous communities, it's much more, you know, sort of working as a, a cooperative. And, you know, Chad, I'm thinking about when we were in the Galapagos. Remember, I worked with the primary teachers. Um, they were so open to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. And if we can start that at the primary level and build. Mm -hmm. um, and just, again, just, it doesn't necessarily start by, well, we, I hope we can get into talking about this rubric in a minute, because that might actually address it. Yeah. But I, I will tell you just from personal experience, I, my first 12 years of education were Catholic schools, very traditional Catholic schools, and we never questioned a teacher, never. I mean, it just wasn't acceptable. When I got to college, it was really hard for me to think about, I'm allowed to question this person, you know, they, I mean, everybody had poured all the information into me that I needed, and I was a good little girl and did as I was told. Um, and I just think about what we're doing with students now and how much 
um, even from a mathematical perspective, if our goal is not necessarily around, quote, questioning authority, but we can approach it as building deeper mathematical understanding by talking about our thinking, then if people are uncomfortable with that notion of we're teaching them to question authority, that's really not what we're doing. We're actually teaching them to talk about their ideas and their thinking. Um, and mathematics doesn't necessarily have to get political or anything else. I mean, I think mathematics leaves a really nice context for having these kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never it's, thought about that question. It's such a good question. Yeah, Callie. Um, well, I was thinking like linking it back to goals is something that I have leaned on because I agree with Alex in a lot of sense where culturally, like even with some of my friends in Latin America, if they think that what you're saying is challenging them in any kind of way, they won't even respond to a question anymore. Mm. Like, and, and there it's like, well, no, my mom taught me like when she asks you a question and the tone changes, you don't say a word. Like, and I, and wow. I'm sitting here thinking like, why aren't you answering me? I'm like trying to figure this out, you know? And like my frustration rises in those moments sometimes. And, um, so I think it's kind of a mix and, um, but even in working with teachers and also in communicating with parents, being able to talk about like, what, what is it that you want for, for the kids, for the students? Like, why are you a teacher? Why do you like this? You know, what, why do you choose this, this job? <laughs> um, if, if you made the choice to be here and if this is what you want, like, why are you here? Or why are you sending your girl to girl STEM club? Like, why are you interested in that? And almost creating a little bit of cognitive dissonance in like, this is the, the future that you're telling me about. Maybe it's not very concrete. You know, maybe you, you're telling me though, that you believe that your girl, your daughter has, is capable and you want her to have more opportunities. But then when you challenge and say, well, she shouldn't be thinking about things in both ways. And then there's this, well, wait a minute, didn't you say like what you wanted her to have more possibilities? And even in where we talked about the like levels of mathematical thinking and uh, in a previous role, I used a lot of like Webb's depth of knowledge. It's very similar to those levels of mathematical thinking, but just for a broader range of, of context or content. And um, one of the things that I've had teachers do is talk about like looking at the skills of like, what kinds of jobs do you need to be able to just like repeat something to just apply something and what kind of jobs do you need like strategic thinking or reasoning for and so they make a list and then um because what we got a lot of pushback from in our school in north carolina when we were like okay our kids are really getting stuck at these dok level two questions and threes and fours they're not doing so well on end of grade tests and all in benchmarks and all of these assessments and the teachers were like well why like if they can follow the formula and get an answer why do they need to go further than that and so we really had to to stop and look at it like well what is it that we want for our kids and which you know which level of thinking are we working in with them so what are we creating what are we setting them up to be if we say repeat the process good job hundred you made it you've reached the the end Right versus here. being able to build strategic thinking. And I think that's really helpful. And it's also not simple. It's very, very complex. It's complex. I think even the ones that uh, already jumped that step that Kali said, that they, they understood why it is important and they really and truly believe that their kids or maybe their, their students uh, can be different, thinking different and doing different tasks, they are totally afraid of uh, losing control. Mm -hmm. That's something really that happens here because when you let students to talk, uh, here's something interesting about the, this five steps that we talked before. Uh, anticipate is really great and let them um, breathe a little bit to, to know what could the student uh, think before going into the, the field. <laughs> But uh, even you think in a, or try to anticipate it, the, the possible solutions and the possible way of thinking, you may be, you might find, find yourself in a, 
and an interesting moment with, where, where students will think uh, differently from what you thought. So that, I think that's one of the, the things that uh, teachers are most afraid of because they think they will lose control. It's all about control and uh, control is all about afraid of uh, being wrong. And that's something we have to deal with with them. Right. So it's okay to be wrong. That is even an, a great opportunity to your students to see you're wrong and to see that you can both together build something and try to figure out things together. So that's, I think that that's one of the greatest or, or the hardest part here when we are trying to work with teachers. Right. So, yeah. And that's a wonderful segue. I'm watching the time to take yeah, a look thank at you, that. Linda. I was going to move into that too. So good. I, I want to connect that to what Paula was just saying. And um, that is you don't go, I think the teachers need to understand you don't go into a classroom and expect kids to be able to talk about, or you just set them free to talk about and, you, you know, there are really steps to doing this and there are certain times when, you know, you want, you need to be more in control and there are other times when you want the kids to be more in control and, and learning how to do that um, and when to do that. I think that that rubric sets that up nicely. So if we could take a look at the rubric mm -hmm. and if um, I did this with a group of elementary teachers, um, actually, several times because it was a different group but um i, I want to explain the chart to you just a little bit or point a couple of things out but and i will also tell you i'm going to save the big surprise for now um we actually by the time we got finished with this rubric we I, the teachers actually developed one that they liked better and i thought was actually stronger than this one so uh, <laughs> this is not carved in stone it's not exactly what you have to do but what i love about this rubric is um, you don't have to try to take on everything at one time. So you might start with what is the teacher role uh, in discourse or what kind of questions, what kind of questions are happening when you're really um, focusing on mathematical discourse or how do we get kids to explain their mathematical thinking? Um, what are the mathematical representations you use? And when you actually think about those different columns, many of them are directly related to the effective teaching practices. So, <coughs> just to kind of facilitate the conversation here or the discourse. Um, I'd like you to, uh, we did this by column. So our time is limited. I don't think we can, um, well, I don't know if you prefer to do it by column or if you want to look across the whole row of level zero, then level one, then level two. Um, what do you think? Or, choice. Um, I think it's, I think it's good to go by columns maybe. I, do, I actually do too, but we may run out of time, but at least it yeah, gives so. us some initial conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, you, if you guys would take a look at the role of the teacher on each one of the levels and think about the progression that that takes and how you might help teachers to, where do you think your teachers are functioning right now? And how do you think those levels might help them to actually build their comfort with having more discourse in the classroom. So let's just take a, a moment to look at that column. Does everyone have that handy? I am looking for. What I will do is, hold on, I think I can share it with you all. I'll share my screen in a second, if I can get this to the right size. Uh, oops, that's not, uh, all right, I'll share my screen and you guys can see this then. Just make sure I don't, okay. All right, so hopefully you all can see this column we're looking yeah. at right now. Yep. Okay, so we're talking, we're looking at level, the first column, right, Linda, the teacher's role? Right, teacher's role.
I see a lot of teachers between zero and one. I think a lot of times what it looks like, like they want students to be particip like to be participating in classes and say their answers. And what I see a ton in Hope of Bastion is, um, which will also link into the next column too, I think, but it's a lot of like, the, the question is asked where it's really, there's just a one word answer and all of the students shout it out. So there's not like hand raising, yeah. but it's just like everyone yells this and then they keep going a little bit more and everyone yells this and that happens a lot. Reminds me of Amori Esperanza as well. And I would say in El Paradon, we mostly saw level zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we did see level one, it wasn't about sharing math ideas. It was pretty much about just giving the answer. And I think there's a difference in level one between just having kids get the answer and sharing ideas. You know, Linda, would you say that the prerequisite for moving to level two and three, though, is a good task? Because it is, but I, I, it is, it is. Um, however, I think as teachers, if most of them are at level zero, and some of them are leaning a little bit more toward level one. Um, giving them that opportunity to move from level zero to level one has got to happen before they're going to start feeling comfortable with level two or, or even level three. Okay. You know, they've really got to encourage the sharing of math ideas where they take over being the, or they give up being the expert. I mean, they're still the expert in some respects, but kids are sharing their thinking and their ideas now, which is a big jump from the teacher just doing a show and tell lesson. Yeah. And the kids mimicking her or him. Mm -hmm. And I think the next step that I see a lot, but that's also kind of between those two, like when a teacher does have a student ex explain their work, they come to the board, they show what they did. And if they have to talk about it, like I'll hear teachers say like, tell the class, don't tell me. Nice. But then it's just like, I subtracted four and then I put my one and then right. I subtracted right. three exactly. and I got this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the teacher learning how to ask those good questions to justify the thinking and, yeah. There's no why, yeah. Uh-huh. Yet. Okay. Okay. And most kids do think that, you know, when they're giving an answer, they're giving it to the teacher. And so, again, I think that there are very doable steps between moving from level zero to level one and understanding what level one really uh, encourages it's not I'm, I'm not doing level one if I just have a kid going to the board and saying I put down the three and carried the one um, that's not what level one is talking about what is level um, one about, Linda? well it's about the sharing of math ideas and not just mathematical processes so if I'm adding let's just say I'm adding 27 and 36 and I say, well, seven plus six is 13. I put down the three and carry the one. And I, that's not a rich task at all. It's pretty, pretty basic one. But I would want kids to understand, or to at least be able to explain, wow, I've, I've got 10 ones, so now I can make a 10 and put that up in the next column. That to me is very different than I put down the three and carried the one. In one case, I'm really explaining the, the mathematical idea or why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it might be a weak example, rather than just what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's, again, based on my limited experience of visiting classrooms, I think when kids are talking, the put down the three and carry the one is the kind of talking they're doing. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about level one, it's really emphasizing this idea of sharing math ideas and not just what did I do, but why did I do that? Why does it work that way? Mm -hmm. um, and again, at this point, I'm not even talking about doing a rich task. I'm just talking about how am I teaching just fundamental mathematics more than procedures, but conceptual understanding, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think if teachers um, have to be comfortable with level one before they can start to move to level two. Hmm. Interesting. I was thinking even in, at the university uh, here in Ecuador, and uh, uh, David can say something about that, but we are definitely number level one at the university. Mm -hmm. So we have to start thinking a lot if we're in that level in one of the, huge, uh, huge, the greatest university here in Ecuador. 
Yeah, well, and I can tell you that in many universities here, they're at level one. <laughs> yeah, but so that's it, the way mathematics is taught. But if you want to move from level, let's see, two to three, sometimes you have to change the methodology as well, because I did try in a logic class, uh, logic and set theory, with a very nice book, I tried to do flipping the classroom. Mm -hmm. and flipping the classroom is a completely, uh, then it makes sense to go to level two or three. So David, let me ask you a question uh, to all of you, but that, that raises a good point. And again, this really came from the teachers that I was working with. It did not necessarily come from me. Are there times that you really want to be at level one and not at level three? Are there times that um, you want to be at level two? I mean, how uh, do you think you always want to be at level three when you're teaching? Um, and again, I'm going to go to young children. <laughs> um is is that some place you you want to strive for all the time i don't think so from my perspective and why is that because there are difficult mathematical ideas even though the students could read beforehand you have to present good images of the concept so sometimes there are the the mathematical ideas tells you what will be a little bit your role from my perspective. Now, if I come up with a good problem that could, uh, uh, the students get engaged and they get very active, of course, there is a lot of act math activity around the problem. So then I can take a different role. So from my perspective, the mathematics tells me a little bit what methodology to use and what will be my level. At, at least that's the way I see it as a mathematician. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I would, I would say there are two components to that. Um, so, like the research shows at the highest levels of math, you sort of really the the kids are doing the level two and three on their own. You know, like if you're teaching a a real analysis class, you know, like proving well, that's a different story. So, um, but but you know, with the you know what I love is is like thinking about my classroom as flipped in the sense that I give the students the time to talk to each other, work together in the classroom, and then I push them harder afterwards to do more challenging problems rather than to read new material to reflect on what they're learning. And um, I, I think in those cases, that's appropriate, again, if you have a great task. Um, however, there are times where you need to just, look, I'm not going to say discover the definition of a square. Right. I'm going to, you're going to discover characteristics of it, and then I need to tell you. And one of my, my this woman that I loved, um, was my advisor um, through a PhD program, said, look, there are sometimes you have to lecture. Um, it doesn't, but it should not be long. It should be very short because the students need to be active participants. And I love that Linda pointed that out because you need to be able to do level three at any time. It's like if you're a black belt in karate, right? I could do white belt moves. But I also can do black belt moves. It depends on the time. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's very interesting because some of my students have discovered, let's see, little, little, little theorems that, uh, of course, they have their names, you know, Morera's theorem. Uh -huh. But since they discovered, we changed the name. So we said Chavez, Rosado, and Melinda's theorem. So say, well, Morera's theorem. Okay, yeah. So let's add that name as well. So not not a big deal. So they know I it's not that serious. It doesn't matter. We discover somehow that theorem. Why not? In the context of the class, of course, it has a different name. But for the community, of course, that will be still the Morera's theorem. That's it. Yeah. Hey, Linda, we have about nine minutes total, and I do have a hard stop today. Um, and I want yeah. a little time for talking. And one thing we could always do is work our way through the book and then come back and rebuild this ourselves. That might be interesting. And I don't, actually what I was thinking of, um, since next week, Arthur's, or next time we meet, Arthur's talking about posting pur purposeful questions. Yes. Maybe we can come back and revisit this rubric on um, questioning after, you know, after we've had some conversation around questioning. And I would encourage all of you to look at mathematical representations because we have talked about that. And so what does this look like um, 
when I want kids to represent their thinking in different ways and the ways that make the most sense to them. So um, I wanted to use this as a guidepost. I also want to share with you that the teachers I was working with, um, when they got down to level three going across, so I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to speed read across level three. Okay, even if you didn't finish, I just want to share with you how one of those teachers um, described level three. She said, at that point, the kids have taken over to the classroom and I could be sitting drinking coffee. Um, and, and I like that because actually, if you read level three, the kids really have taken over ownership for their learning. But that doesn't happen right away. And kids can't do that all the time. So level three um is where i might want to be sometimes but it might not be where i want to be definitely isn't where i want to be all the time uh, kids oftentimes don't have enough knowledge to be able to handle this is our opinion uh, you know um that that kids are often when a, a topic is first introduced ready to do that now if they have a rich task they may may take on more of the a class might take on more of the characteristics of level three but i don't want them thinking that the teacher's role is not important at um at any level of discourse right um, and the last thing i'm going to say is i don't know if we will get to this but when we were talking about culture and we were talking about um you know how would this be accepted in countries outside of the united states um, when i looked on that final column to me that is about building classroom culture and building respect for each other's thinking and ideas. And so, although that might not be directly linked to any of the other effective, effective teaching practices, I think that's a really powerful progression for teachers to look at. How am I building a culture of learning and respect in my classroom? So I would encourage you to, to take a closer look at that as well, and maybe continue to talk about it among yourselves. Yeah, that's that's powerful. That's important to me. Um, so just in case we run out of time, I want to say to all of you, um, I always love when we have guests and I'm so glad David's here. And one, because I'm just so proud of the group that we've put together. I'm proud of myself for putting this group together. I don't want to say I'm proud of you because that makes me sound like I'm a, some sort of authority, but I'm impressed by you all. And so it's fun to show off what we're doing. I think the thinking you guys are doing is good. The other thing I want to say is now you know why Linda and I are staying in the United States and letting you guys do the work on the ground because this is hard. <laughs> and I really appreciate the work you're doing. Yes, you so guys are awesome. You have any comments? Um, I all know that you're all thinking what a great job I'm doing, so you don't need to say that. Um, <laughs> but what other things do you want to say or comment? Questions? Yeah, uh, I love the idea of drinking coffee while you're <laughs> having the class. That um, makes me think. When, when I did those, when I got to the, those levels in, in one of my classes, sometimes they, the students ask me, so what are you doing? You, 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 we don't need you. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad they, they think like that. That's what I was hoping to. But uh, then when I say some, th this kind of things to other teachers that are not used to do this kind of classes, then they think you are not doing your job. And then, um, always think planning the class is yeah. what takes me the most yeah together so we can get there is really an important uh, step and I, I would argue that it's harder work to get to level three where good learning is happening in the classroom than it is to function at any of those other levels because if you haven't orchestrated that as a teacher then you're never going to get to level three it's not you know that's where kids are all goofing around and nothing's really happening. So it's not easy to uh, still be a, a good facilitator and, and get to that point where kids have the confidence and the ability to, to really take on their own learning. And I think that's what level, level three is about. Yeah. I could do an algebra lesson, any topic right now with no prep, right? If I want to do a level zero. But if I want to do level three, I need to spend time thinking about what my students know, where I want them to go, and how they're going to know it, 
and, and what they're prepared for and what tools I have and what tasks I want to give them that's relevant to them. It's a lot more work. And what, pre and what prerequisite people learn, easy for me to say, prerequisite knowledge they need to be able to carry on um, those kind of conversations and sharing of ideas at level three. Yeah. If they don't have the knowledge, level three is going to blow up on you. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what to ask, and then you are allowed to drink coffee during the class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that that was a very cute description. She said, I could be down in the faculty room drinking coffee. <laughs> I said, well, we're not quite there yet, but. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? We could sure use that idea though now, right? I mean, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at kids who have to teach themselves and you have to be sort of guiding them to do it work. What other questions? Any other questions? We literally have two minutes. It makes me, like what we were just talking about makes me think too, like the concept of teacher buy-in here is so important because if it's requiring a lot more work, a lot more prep than what a teacher may be used to, why should they change? Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if we always do a good job of that or, or not. And like, not just us, but like everyone in general, like, you know, we should do this, we should do this, best practices, let's do this. Well, why? Why is that what's best for students? And so I, I wonder how we can consider that too. Well, teachers care deeply about their students learning because everywhere teachers don't get paid enough and they're not respected in their communities the way they should be. So. If I'm going to put the effort, and effort into that, I want to be the, as effective as possible. So that's the thing I think. I think almost every teacher wants to see their kid in 20 years go, oh my gosh, I'm so successful, thank you. That happens because of the way we teach. We teach this way. So that's the thing I would say. I think we might have to like explicitly make that connection more yeah. than just make it seem like we're yeah. asking more of them for nothing. You know? Right, good point. All right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, so next week, Arthur Powell is gonna be here and Lynn is gonna be facilitating with me. Um, and then the week after, we're gonna skip ahead and do one other because we have the, basically the person that wrote that section. Uh, thanks to Linda working with us. And David, you're welcome to join us anytime you want. These are great conversations. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for Thank you. having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, guys, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm sorry. It's just a good question. Pardon me? Who, who, is, who is living in Chapel Hill? Oh, that's me. Chad. That oh, because my son is living there. He's attending UNC. Really? That's well, the math department. Wow. I can I call the physics department. Statistics, yeah. Is it biostatistics or is it is he an undergraduate? He is uh, doing his PhD. He already presented his proposal. So, I was in the statistics department at NC North Carolina State and then math education at, at, at UNC. So I'm familiar with some of that stuff. And yeah, you should have him connect with me if you don't mind. When it's, I think we will visit him soon. <laughs> well, you're welcome to see us. You should see the, the, the home office here. All right, great. All right. See you guys. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.